away that one again. The expansion of the distribution channels to include franchise outlets was a major decision for Wally Amos. The first retail stores were company-owned, which proved to be too expensive and too risky to operate. It was a beautiful store. Um, Gil Brown and, and, and Vera Brown, they owned that shopping center. It's was called the Brown Center, and my slogan was, have a very brown day. I just knew that was fate, that I was supposed to be there, you know? And maybe I was, but it was, a, it was, it was, it was just off of Ventura Boulevard, you know? It was just enough hidden that nobody ever saw the store. Uh, then in, Tars in, in, um, in Tucson, Arizona, we opened at a location that was not an air-conditioned shopping center. It was also in an area of Tucson that, that wasn't quite developed yet. Um, I, I learned an important lesson from both of those. And, and uh, they say that the cardinal rule in retail, you know, is location, location, location. We want to mix here. The batter here. Batter here. Right. And sent to Japan by a refrigerated container. If you're talking a, a batter-making facility, it was through the hot bake stores that Wally created a demand for his cookie overseas. The, the cookie being indigenous to America, it makes it all the more popular overseas. Our experience in Asia and, and a couple of Western countries has been exceptional. The, the trend of the, of the world is to go into American fast foods, whether it be in a well-known hamburger or donut companies or whatever. American food is very, very popular all over the world. We're in Australia, we're in Canada, we're in Japan. We do business with Sony in Japan. Now we are preparing a leaflet for Christmas season. We need your uh, authorization on this leaflet. Is this leaflet for uh, your customers to pick up off the counter? In sure. Stores? One of the most uh, important parts of our work with overseas uh, partners, licensees, is that they fully understand that we will approve everything with our name on it. And Wally Amos himself gets involved in this, that um, we don't want photographs of our cookies, we don't want our name printed, we don't want advertising going on or promotions going on that aren't with our full knowledge and control. Wally Amos created such publicity for himself and the cookie that he could not withstand the temptation to exploit other markets. We've got this really super famous name, so what else can we do with it? In a quality way, I mean, I don't want to prostitute the name, you know, but um, uh, it can surely be applied to, to some other uh, products with the integrity of the cookie. Well, we're looking at additional new products right now and an expansion of the cookie line. We're going to uh, be testing and are testing in a few stores right now a full complete line of fresh baked croissants. This is an example of, of our new waffle cone. If somebody just wants to have a single scoop of ice cream, we can put the ice cream in here. Our ice cream uh, concept is very, very important. We don't feel that cookie stores alone are going to be able to be self-sustaining pay their own way in the future. So ice cream ensures that it will do business year-round at different times of the day and take away some of the peaks and valleys of the sales curve, uh, especially during the summer months when bakery sales traditionally taper off a little bit. The batter that we sell to our franchise stores, uh, the batter is frozen. Uh, as we develop another product, we would develop a product that is also frozen so that the distribution of the, both of those products could be done at the same time. Whether it was cookies or kazoos, until 1986, it was Wally's magnetism that fueled product demand. All right, guys. I'm never going to do this spot again. Now, this is it, okay? <laughs> you better get everything right this time, because even if I don't do it right, it's, I mean, forget it, you know what I mean? Huh? Huh? Ready? Okay, listen up, cookie fiends. Now we're putting famous Amos chocolate chip cookies into Lewis Sherry ice cream. You're gonna love it. <laughs> it's delicious. I'm on your refrigerator. I'm in your pantry. I'm in your desk drawer. I'm in a supermarket. I'm in convenience stores. I'm in department stores. I'm in service stations. I'm in airports. I'm on television. That's what makes Amos famous. <laughs> Wally created an enormous demand for his cookies, but unfortunately, his distribution goals were never fully realized. So, in 1986, he decided to sell the company.
the real attraction for us w when we made the acquisition of Famous Amos, or what prompted the acquisition of Famous Amos, was the brand name and the consumer's perceived quality of the brand. Uh, it's a brand that enjoyed almost 60% household awareness and was perceived as high quality. Uh, that type of brand typically is not on the market. Uh, they're generally held by major packaged goods companies. As important as the physical distribution of the cookie from the bakery to the supermarket is the effort required to open new channels of distribution. Today, as in the past, the problem is how to squeeze your product into the already crowded cookie aisle. If we want to bring a product into the store, the first thing you have to do is you have to make an appointment with a buyer. You have to show him the product and he has to agree to bring the product in. And then after he agrees to it, you've got to find a place for the product. And there's, that's where you can either lose it or, or gain it and in, in these big stores. For many years, Nabisco owned the cookie section. I mean, they, I don't know how many feet they had. And that's how they refer to space on the shelf as feet. And uh, gradually, a lot of the companies, their competition figured out that there were a lot of items on there that were very slow movers. So what they came in is they came in and resold the buyers on the idea that they could put product on the shelf that would double or triple their sales in that same position. So Nabisco was forced to take out their slower moving items. And this is still going on and more people are, are jumping into that war right now. As always, the challenge for Famous Amos continues to be effective distribution. We work hard at getting our products displayed appropriately to play to the impulse aspect of the cookie category. The various classes of trade or distribution channels require different mechanisms for merchandising. But if we focus for a moment on club stores, we felt it was important to have a very attractive, uh, unassuming display that allowed product visibility to be the number one criteria for the display. If you look at grocery stores, we have brokers, our distribution systems have salespeople, and we also contract with merchandising companies to be sure that our product is out, always on the shelf where it should be, and that we get displays at every opportunity. When you look at vending, you are in effect always on display in the vending machine as long as you're in stock, and then that comes back to service levels again, making sure that the distribution systems are getting product when they need them. Today, improved baking conditions have made the product less perishable, but service is still key to effective distribution. Well, service is a key issue in any industry today because everyone is trying to manage their inventories. So if our service levels are not what they should be, then what occurs is we actually go out of stock at the point of sale. Again, going back to the issue that it's an impulse buy, if the consumer reaches the point of sale, whether it be a vending machine, a grocery store, or a club store, and our product isn't there, typically they will make another selection, and that, consumer, that consumer's initial purchase or, or current purchase goes away, cannot be regained, and it's not inconceivable that we could lose the consumer who next time will come back and bought what they bought the previous time. It's important for us to keep all of our distribution systems stocked. It's important for us to be what's known as a reliable supplier, that we deliver the product on the dates that they've requested that it arrive. Therefore, eliminating a lot of the inventory problems that our distribution systems will have. Under the new ownership, the decision was made to eliminate the fresh baked stores. Well, when we got involved with Famous Amos, we felt that there was enormous opportunity, but that the brand would have to be repositioned. To do that, we felt that the business also had to be focused. The historic ownership of Famous Amos, uh, in their efforts of channel marketing, actually brought the company into various businesses that, in effect, were unrelated. Uh, they were in the licensing business, they were in the packaged goods business, they were in the franchise business, they ran company stores. They were in businesses that are hard to manage, that require independent management, and that also have a tendency to confuse the consumer because the products are not always alike. 
we felt that we could take what had been perceived as a gourmet product or a very high quality cookie, take it from a gourmet, if you will, or specialty positioning and bring it down to a premium positioning um, in a competitive position to, let's say, Nabisco's Chips Ahoy product and be just in the packaged goods business. So what we really did, in effect, was collapse the company from a business that was involved in virtually five businesses at one time to a company that's in the packaged goods business. Today, the company is back to selling one kind of cookie, but distributes it through supermarkets, club stores, convenience stores, and vending machines. Wally Amos had been quite successful in building consumer demand for the cookie abroad. Today, the company still maintains many of Wally's original foreign outlets. Famous Amos cookies are available internationally, but on a very limited basis. We have two businesses that, that are basically outside the confines of the United States. We sell packaged cookies, which are a rather new venture for the company, into Canada, uh, into the club store class of trade, as well as the grocery classes of trade. The historic offshore business that Famous Amos had was in the Pacific Rim, Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia where those are predominantly fresh baked stores. In that market, the licensee, if you will, services both grocery accounts and fresh bake outlets. And I really don't see that changing uh, in, the, in the near future, principally because due to baking conditions, climate, and consumer preference, preference being more like a traditional English biscuit. The small hard cookie is the cookie of preference and therefore unlike here in the States they bake the same cookie in a fresh bake outlet as they do for grocery outlets. So they're not really confusing the consumer. Under the ownership of Wally Amos the decision was made to offer the additional product lines while using the same channels of distribution. In the opinion of the new owners, this decision led to customer confusion. Famous Amos only makes cookies at this point in time, and it is our expectations that we won't exceed that. We feel that there are so many enormous opportunities that we not only moved away from the licensing agreements that we once had for other products, but we've actually compressed our own packaged cookie line by approximately 25 percent. We feel that the three flavors of cookies that we are currently manufacturing distributed through all of the potential channels are more than enough challenge uh, for, uh, for this organization. We really found with Famous Amos Chocolate Chip Cookie Company, the same thing you'd find with any company. You really have to define up front what business it is you want to be in before you get in. And then you have to set objectives based on that positioning and direction. And then you have to be very disciplined and stay with them. When you've got a brand like Famous Amos that is widely recognized, you find that there are numerous opportunities that find you that just happen to come in over the transom. Um, if you're not disciplined and not focused, you have a tendency to take your eye off what the primary objective is, address all of these opportunities that appear to be coming your way, and then you have the, the, the real opportunity of running into problems by not staying focused. <laughs> 